Welcome to the House of God International Headquarters, located in Lexington, Kentucky. Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast today. We know that you will be blessed. To learn more about the House of God, visit us online at www.houseofgod.org. Be blessed. Praise the Lord to all of you today. We're thankful to God for blessing us to be able to share one more time on our weekly uh, presentation. We pray that all is well with each of you. We thank God for all of his mercy, his grace, his kindness. We just thank God for being so kind and merciful uh, to all of us. And uh, I pray that things are well with each of you and your families. Uh, to all of our House of God members that may be sharing today, any friends or visitors that have tuned in to be with us. We appreciate your presence so much, and we're thankful to God for all of his many, many blessings. Uh, someone was sharing with me just recently how merciful God has been uh, during these times of COVID-19, and also during this time when life doesn't stop. It doesn't stop in times of difficulty, uh, things are still necessary. Uh, provisions still have to be made for us. Through all of that, God is merciful. So praise God for each of you today. We thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And we pray that uh, our presentations are beneficial uh, to those of you that share. Uh, as, as opening reminders, I want to remind you, of our upcoming district meetings that will happen on June 19th. Now, all of these will be virtual meetings that will be held concurrently around the country. We hope that you are making plans to be a part of the district meetings in your location and the superintendents are working with you and you're responding, uh, making ready for these district meetings. Our district meetings are a very important part of our church structure and has been for many, many years. Uh, these are meetings that are held in person uh, under normal circumstances, but COVID-19 has changed a lot of things. Uh, our virtual meetings were, we had virtual meetings last year. We want to continue that this year and prayerfully we'll be able to meet in person uh, next year for our district meetings. And I understand that uh, the virus or COVID-19 is trending down uh, around the country, but there are still areas where extra caution must be taken and extra precaution taken even as things trend down to be sure that we're keeping uh, the members safe. So our meeting, district meetings, all of them will be on June 19th, June 19th. And they will be virtual meetings. So thank you for your support. Uh, thank you for your church reports. Thank you for your financial reports. Uh, thank you for uh, participating. And we certainly want to give a shout out to our finance department, uh, national finance department, as working with superintendents and pastors, facilitating a way that uh, we may uh, continue to make our reports and our gifts. So we thank them for the efforts on behalf of the church. Thank all of you uh, that are making ready for those June 19th divisional meetings. The second announcement that I wish to make has to do with our annual convocation. Uh, what an event that annual convocation is. Uh, it's been a part of the church for as long as I can remember, and certainly before I was an adult and, and involved in the church annual convocation was that time of year uh, when members of this church uh, from around the country and around the world uh, convened here in Lexington for our annual general uh, convocation. It's always been in person uh, with the exception of last year and uh, that was because of COVID-19. This year plans are to have our annual convocation in person where we can see each other, uh, greet each other, and be present with each other at that 
a time of year. A little bit different this year in terms of the time for annual convocation. It's going to be held during the Feast of Tabernacles, during the Feast of Tabernacles this year uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, yes, things are trending down, things are opening up, they're opening up here, they're opening up around the country, but there are still areas where there may be some dangers. And because of that, uh, we changed the date, time, for annual convocation from July, which is a traditional time, to September at the Feast of Tabernacles. So our annual convocation will convene on September 23rd. That is on a Thursday, a Thursday night or Thursday evening. We'll have our opening session of the annual convocation this year on September the 23rd. It will proceed through Sabbath day, September 25th, and close out on that Sabbath day. So we're looking forward to it. I know many of you have already made reservations. You're making plans. Uh, you've made airline reservations, travel reservations, accommodation reservations to be present for this convocation. And it's going to be a convocation like we've never had before, having been quarantined or separated from each other for a whole year. Uh, we're looking forward to convocation this year doing the Feast of Tabernacles. Again, convening on Thursday, September 23rd, through Sabbath day, September 25th. So if you haven't made reservations, I hope that you're planning to do that so you can be a part of this convocation. Uh, so much has happened uh, since the last time we were together, and uh, we're looking forward to it. Our theme this year is finding our way back home. Finding our way back home. We have not forsaken the need to assemble We've not forsaken the need to be in the Lord's house. And we're finding our way back to the place uh, where we come on an annual basis and share together doing annual convocation. So just want to keep that uh, in your thoughts and mark your calendars and get ready for that. There will be more information coming uh, from our program committee as, as final plans are being made. But we're definitely planning the in-person convocation this year. So keep that in mind and uh, mark your calendars. Be ready to meet us here for the annual, general annual convocation of the House of God this year. For several weeks, uh, we have been talking about the uh, disciples or apostles after uh, the ascension of Jesus Christ after his 40-day mission here on earth uh, in his resurrected body. And all of us that read the Bible know the account. Uh, Jesus rose from the dead and made himself visible for 40 days on the earth, spending that time with intense training, uh, fellowship, instructions, and empowering the disciples to carry on the mission uh, once he ascended back to the Father. It's interesting, it's an interesting time to watch. Uh, he made great promises to his disciples, assured them that he would be with them always, assured them uh, that he would empower them uh, through the gift of the Holy Ghost. They had not had the experience of ministry without Jesus Christ. And even before his death, going back to uh, John chapter 13 and uh, 16 and all those chapters where he spent a lot of time teaching uh, them what to expect. But they had not had the actual experience of being without him. And because of that, he felt it necessary to do some intense training and intense uh, witnessing to them in his resurrected body so that once he physically left this earth, 
that they would be uh, witnesses of him and empowered uh, with all confidence of his dwelling with them through the Holy Ghost. So you, the, the verse, the theme verse that I've used for this is from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when Jesus said that, that they would receive power after that the Holy Ghost had come upon them, that they would be witnesses of him uh, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, all of those places where they would have an opportunity to tell the story and to witness the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he said that, that the empowerment would come from the Holy Ghost. And, and what, what a beautiful picture, because when I look, look at this, I, I, I have the visual in this, in this text. Because right after he said those words, Luke records that he was received back up into heaven out of their sights, received up into the clouds as he ascended for them. And that had to be a memory that they carried with them uh, throughout their lives. He also said in Matthew chapter uh, 28, he commanded them and gave them the commission to preach, teach all the things that, that he had instructed them. And, and lo, he would be with them. That's got to be something that stayed with them as well, that he would be with them even until the end of the world. So he did everything he could to empower them in those 40 days. But we've been tracking them since Jesus ascended back to the Father. We've been, we've been tracking him. And he told them to, to go to Jerusalem and to wait there and tarry there until they be endued with power from on high. And of course, that was the Holy Ghost uh, the promise of the Holy Ghost that would be fulfilled in them. So we continue to follow the, process, uh, the progress of the apostles after the ascension of Jesus Christ. Our focus is on the mission given to them by Christ himself to witness and to teach and to preach the gospel to all nations. That's the mission. That's the mission. And since the day of Pentecost, when the apostles received the gift of the Holy Ghost, uh, they performed miracles um, in the name of Jesus Christ. Thousands of people have, have laid hold on the message of the, from the preaching and teaching of the apostles. Uh, the Holy Ghost is guiding them through the process as they witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now the apostles were witnesses that were powered by the Holy Ghost. Think about that. They're witnesses. But the power to witness is really coming from the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. So there are all kinds of things that are happening with them that have happened. And this is why Acts is such an exciting book to read. Uh, we don't think much about it sometimes. We read it and we see the Acts of the Apostles and we, 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 we see that as lights and whistles and all those things that we associate with the events that have happened to Jesus Christ. But they're not just doing show and tell. These examples that we read in Acts really are the empowerment that come from the Holy Ghost. There are a number of things uh, that have happened that the world had not seen before. And, and in Acts chapter 1 verse 9 is one of them. The visible manifestation of the Holy Ghost in tongues of fire. That happened on the, that happened on the day of Pentecost. That was the visual manifestation of the Holy Ghost that was actually visualized by fire. You say, well, I've never seen the Holy Ghost. Well, those tongues, those tongues of fire were a visible manifestation 
on the Holy Ghost. The things that are being done in Acts are things that are out of the ordinary. you got to remember, the message of Jesus Christ had never been preached before. Jesus walked this earth and taught and preached. But that message of him, his death, his burial, and resurrection, that was not the message that people were accustomed to hearing. So in order for that to be promoted, there had to be things that were out of the ordinary. And these 12 apostles or disciples, their job is to carry that message. I know every time you read Acts, it's the Acts of the Apostles. We don't think about what the real mission is. Getting the word out of Jesus on Jesus Christ. And doing and 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 being and, and watching the empowerment that happens through the Holy Ghost that makes these things extraordinary beyond anything that people had seen in terms of the message. They're used to having the the scriptures read. They're used to reading the, the scriptures, but nothing like this that is revitalizing and energizing people. That day of Pentecost experience was something that people had not seen, hadn't in any idea of what that was. So the, the, the visible, we read that, and, and, and when we read it, it's hard for us to visualize that. That was God's way of saying, I am going to have a visual manifestation of the Holy Ghost and shown in tongues of fire. Now, there's nothing that's ever happened like that before in that way. That was a one-time event in terms of the visual manifestation. You don't see that uh, happening today. But to get the attention of people to say, there is something going on here that, that is clearly under the authority of the Almighty God through Jesus Christ when the tongues of fire uh, were manifest upon these individuals on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Read it for yourself. It's there. And, and what, a, what a manifestation that was. It captured the attention of everyone to the point that people had to ask questions. What is this that we're looking at? Another extraordinary event that happened in Acts chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. Healing of a lame man at the temple gate. Keep in mind as we go through these, that Christ said to the disciples, you will be witnesses of me and you will be empowered by the Holy Ghost. So there are things that are happening that are capturing people's attention. Man that never walked before, man that had legs that were not ever used, muscles that were atrophied, all of these things sitting at the gate at the temple every day. Read the account, Acts chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. That man was healed, delivered. How was it done? It was done in the name of Jesus Christ. So what is Christ doing with these apostles? He is empowering them that the word will get out that there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. They did not go to the priests. They did not go to the Levites. They did not go to the religious order of the day. It was simply utilization of the power in the name of Jesus Christ. So they're fulfilling the mission that Christ had given them. That's what the Acts of the Apostles is about. It's not just to have a jumping, shouting, whooping church service. This was something different than that. Because these things that took place 
Many of them were outside of the outside of the temple. They were in ordinary places where the power of God was manifested and, and demonstrated through these apostles. In Acts chapter 4, another interesting account. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, God answers prayer by an earthquake. Remember, mission is, you shall be witnesses of me, witnesses of my power, witnesses of my authority, witnesses of the power in my name, witnesses of the working of the Holy Ghost. And you know the account. When Peter and those prayed. They prayed to God. And there was an earthquake that shook the prison, opened the gates, response to the name of Jesus. That's not something that had happened before. Don't you know that the word is getting out? There's something about the name, Jesus Christ. And the Holy Ghost is working with these apostles in tandem with them doing unusual things and showing the power of the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. Understand, I must emphasize this point, because many Pentecostals around the world utilize the Holy Ghost as an expression of times to sing and dance and jump and do all of that. Well, that, that, that may be a part of it. But the mission that Jesus is talking about with the utilization of the Holy Ghost is real power in everyday real life experiences showing that the power of God is relevant in every situation. You got to remember when he talked about the description of the Holy Ghost, he talked about that, that it would bring to their remembrance all the things that they needed to know whatsoever he had taught them. The Holy Ghost not only is the power of God, the Holy Ghost is the intelligence of God that quickens, brings you alive to things that you don't know. Remember, we talked about this the other week from John chapter 16, where he talked about the Holy Ghost being able to see and to hear, and, and what it hears and what it sees, it would share with them. Well, it has that same ability today to see, hear, intercede, interact. That's what's happening in the Acts of the Apostles as these apostles become witnesses to Jesus Christ. Read the account for yourself in Acts chapter 3, or chapter 4, verse 31. Incredible account. Acts chapter 5, there's a fascinating account. I referenced it last week when we talked together. But it shows you that the power of the Holy Ghost is real. It discerns things. It senses things. It knows things that you don't know. This was the message that God was utilizing the apostles to get out in Jerusalem. Not only in Jerusalem, but Judea and Antioch and all of these places. They've got to know that the Holy Ghost has power. We talked about this one last week, Ananias and Sapphira. An amazing account. It was during a period where people had goodwill for the church. During a period where people had goodwill for the mission of sharing the gospel. During a time when people were selling properties and donating the money to the church for the expansion of the word of God. But it was all volunteer. There was no commandment. There was no command to say, do it. You bought into it. You saw it as something worthy and worthwhile. You said, okay, I'm going to do this. And this couple did it. And they'd come back and lay the proceeds or give the proceeds to the apostles. So this couple sold their property. They came back. And they had agreed 
they had agreed that they were going to deceive the apostle. Now, it's no different than people do today. Uh, they don't see the minister as having any, any special insights from the Holy Ghost. They don't see the minister as being empowered by the Holy Ghost. He or she is just an ordinary person just like me. and God talks to me just like he talks to them, so I'm comfortable in saying this, and they won't find out. The point that they missed in that whole little conspiracy was the interaction of the Holy Ghost. And it was the Holy Ghost that quickened to Peter's thoughts to know that this wife is lying. This husband is lying. And what happened, I, this, is, this is a sobering account. What happened when, when the, the husband came and lied that he fell dead? The wife fell dead. Three hours later, three hours difference between when they came. That shocked the church. It rippled through the church. It rippled through the community. And what Peter says, you not lied to us. You lied to God. You lied to the Holy Spirit. How did we know that? Because the Holy Ghost that empowered them gave them that information. Incredible story. I encourage you to go back and read it. That's Acts chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. Go back and read it for yourself. Uh, the Holy Ghost is incredible in what it, can, what it sees, what it knows, what it can do. Why is all of this happening? Why is there such momentum? It is important that the message of Christ is circulated throughout Jerusalem, throughout Judea, all of those places that there's power in the name of Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Ghost is that power of God that is bringing alive knowledge information beyond any human ability. It was so profound. It was so profound. When you read Acts chapter 5, verses 15 through 16, it was so profound. There were so many miracles going on in the name of Jesus until people from all of the surrounding towns and communities, uh, countries, that were coming, that were coming to Jerusalem for the sake of hearing the message of Jesus Christ under the power of, of, of the name of Jesus and operation of the Holy Ghost. People are being healed. People are being delivered. Demons and devils are being cast out. People's eyes are being opened that were blind. Why is all of this going on? It's not for show and tell. It's not miracles for miracles' sake. It's not a, a, a meeting of, of healing. It is meeting the needs of people and showing the power in the name of Jesus Christ. So people are coming from everywhere. People are being converted. By this time, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people that have accepted Jesus Christ, that have been filled with the Holy Ghost, that have been empowered by the Holy Ghost, and they get, keep coming, and the church keeps growing because of the power of the Word of God and the power in the name of Jesus Christ. It's not the music. It's not the singing. It's not the, the charismatic uh, uh, actions of any man. It is the operation of the Holy Ghost being 
indwelled in people to the point that they believe it. It's been proved to them. And who is God using to carry this message after his ascension? He's no longer walking this earth. There must be messengers that carry this. And it is those apostles that he hand-picked, hand-tutored, prayed for in John chapter 17, prayed for all of those that would receive the message. It is those men and the new converts that are believing it. And they're modeling what Jesus did. Jesus walked the streets, found people that needed healing, found people that had mental disorders, found people that were suffering from depression, found people that were dealing with all kinds of diseases. He didn't go to the hospital. He didn't go to the church. He picked them up out of the multitude that found their way to him. And the disciples are doing the same things. There are multitudes of people that follow them. Their message is profound. Their message is true and is being proved through the actions, workings of the Holy Ghost. I mean, there, there, there are phenomenal things happening. In Acts chapter 5, verses 15 through 16, you look at this. People are coming from everywhere. These men are carrying the message of Jesus Christ. To the point that there are multitudes of people that are following them. So much so that they can't get to all of them. They can't lay hands on all of them. They can't anoint all of them. People are standing on the streets in hopes that the shadow of Peter, the shadow of John, the shadow of the apostles will overshadow them. And just being in the presence and shadow of them that they will be healed. This message of Jesus Christ, this message of the resurrection, this message of the Holy Ghost is catching on. It's a simple message. Repent. Be baptized. Every one of you. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's a simple message. It's not steep with deep theology. Believe on Jesus Christ. Be baptized in his name. Repent of your sins. You'll be empowered with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And as simple as that is, people are flocking to that by the thousands, by the tens of thousands. They're coming. They're coming. There are diverse Jews that are coming. There are those that have never heard the message before that are coming. And who's delivering the message? Those 12 disciples that followed Jesus. And converts are being made each and every day. They're being empowered to provide whatever is needed. There's an interesting account in Acts chapter 5, verse 19. You can get it for yourself. This is a new one. Peter, John, because of the opposition from the organized religious group of the day, which are hating this message. Remember, they crucified Jesus. They thought they had gotten rid of him. We don't have to worry about this name, Jesus Christ, anymore. Thank goodness we got rid of him. Now, these 12 apostles, disciples, are carrying the message again. Not only are they carrying the message, they're carrying the message. We crucified him. We got rid of him. We destroyed him. But the message now is stronger. Not only are we dealing with the message of Jesus Christ, we're dealing with the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. 
people are being filled with the Holy Ghost. They're having knowledge that they never had before. Power that they never had before. So the religious leaders are scratching their heads, pulling their hair out, because the name of Jesus is, is taking over. Not only that, there's this thing of baptism. People are being baptized, immersed in water in the name of Jesus Christ, being filled with the Holy Ghost by just calling on the name of Jesus Christ. This message of Christ through these apostles is taking over. And that's exactly what Jesus designed it to be. And he's encouraging them every day. And I'm saying to you, he will encourage you every day. He will encourage you in the presence of your enemies. He will encourage you in the face of disease. He will encourage you when you're dealing with tough times, when your body's sick and you're under doctor's care. Uh, the Holy Ghost will empower you. It will direct you. It directed them. So in Acts chapter 5, I was referencing that, verse 19, when, 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 when Peter was in jail, we've gotten rid of him. And the Holy Ghost empowered him. And an angel, and I, I want you to see this, God sent an angel to literally unlock the door, unlock the gate, unlock the cell that Peter could walk out. Now, if that doesn't get the attention of the jailer and the authorities, because the leaders have said, don't preach and teach in that name anymore. We've locked you up. Don't preach and teach in that name anymore. The angel of the Lord unlocks the door and says, go back to the temple, preach and teach the name of Jesus Christ. They can't stop the message. And that's true today. With all the opposition to the name of Jesus Christ, the message continues on. And many of you are witnesses to the power of the message of Jesus Christ in your life. It's as real today as it was during the time of the Acts of the Apostles that had been powered by the Holy Ghost. Not only is there power to heal and deliver, what these Apostles are experiencing as the church grows, as the ministry grows, they're being empowered to deal with diversity in the church. There's a fascinating account in Acts chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 8. Read it for yourself. But the church was growing so fast. The ministry was expanding so rapidly. So many people of diverse backgrounds coming into the church until they were experiencing an outburst an overflow growth to the point that they were having a hard time handling it, keeping up with it, keeping up with all the different constituencies in the church. You've got young folks in the church. You've got women in the church. You've got men in the church. You've got old folks in the church. You've got all these different groups in the church. And there was an area of the church that was feeling deprived, and, and that was the widow's. Those that didn't have husbands, those that were fending for themselves, those that may have been economically deprived, or whatever the case was. And they were the Grecians. Now this shows you the diversity coming on in the church. So it, it comes to the leaders, it comes to the twelve, comes to the apostles. Listen, uh, we, we're dissatisfied because our, our widows are not being taken care of. Holy Ghost, empowered those apostles, how to deal with it. 
And they looked at it and they said, we understand the problem. We see the need. We understand your point. We're going to find a way to handle the point. But we can't neglect the powerful work going on in the Word of God and preaching the Gospel, uh, you know, to go uh, do home visits and all of that. We've got to stay focused on getting this Word out. But, but here's what we want you to do. We want you to look out among you because there's a multitude of people that have grown into the church. There are a lot of men that have come into the church that can handle this. We want you to look out and find seven of them that are filled with the Holy Ghost, good men, Holy men. We don't mean lecherous men. Uh, we don't mean men that are uh, sexual predators. We mean men that are holy, that are honorable. Look out and find seven of them and, and, and bring those back. And, and we'll put together an order for those to take care of those widows. Those widows need to be taken care of. The, the, the husbands that have died and left their wives, uh, those that are, that, 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 that are without we want to take care of that, but we've got to find a way to do it. The Holy Ghost, this is the point that I want to make with this part of the text, the Holy Ghost will empower you. It will empower the church. It will empower administration to find ways to handle difficult situations. So they did. They looked out and found seven honorable men to handle the rapid growth of, of the church. Now, you look at that, that, that may not mean much to you, but when you look at that and understand that the Holy Ghost is equipped to handle, to empower you to handle difficult situations. So the Holy Ghost is not just working in healing, the Holy Ghost is working in administration, and it still does it today. I'm so excited about this this Acts message, because we, we take it so much for granted. God is empowering the church. It's growing in leaps and bounds in the face of opposition. Critical uh, uh, comments being made about it. Disbelief, but it still keeps moving on. What a message these apostles are carrying to the world in time when they are really setting the standard because nothing like this has happened before. I'm excited about it. I hope you are too. I'm going to have to wrap this up for today. We're going to come back and continue this because I think this is critically important uh, for us to understand. Acts is just not a book of, of, of Pentecostal dancing and shouting. It is the message of Jesus Christ his resurrection and the indwelling of the Holy Ghost that is designed to empower. This message is missed in Holy Ghost teaching. Holy Ghost is designed to empower you to deal with life's things. And it is the intelligence of God that dwells inside of you, in your thoughts, in your decisions, and it guides you. Now, usually when we, when we, when we use that scripture, we're talking about guiding you, guiding you, guiding you. It'll guide you into the Sabbath. It'll guide you. It'll lead you into all these things. It, yes, but it's talking about being a direction in your everyday life. It will guide you into all truth. Truth in the selection of the right doctor. Truth in selecting the right mate. Truth in Selecting the right job. Truth. All truth. So it encompasses a broad sphere of truth. Truth. Making the right decision. The right choice. What a time. Acts of the Apostles. We'll be back next time. We're going to continue this. I hope that you are enjoying this as much as I am enjoying and sharing it with you. God bless all of you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us and share today. We pray that God will continue to bless all of you. Let us pray. Father and eternal God, we're so grateful to you for all of your mercy and your grace and kindness. We're so thankful, God, uh, for the plan of salvation. 
We're so thankful, God, for the expansion of the church. We're so thankful, God, for the gift and the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. Pray, God, as we read the accounts in the book of Acts, that we will see from these beginnings by these 12 men, the gospel of Jesus Christ is spread all over the globe. And we're so thankful today that you've allowed us to have the time to share this fascinating account in the book of Acts. Thank you for all things. These prayers we pray in Jesus' name. Now the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless all of you.